are pretty on Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of Elizabeth Jane Howard's 1950 debut novel, The Beautiful Visit. I finished it a week or so ago and I can't stop thinking about it and I absolutely loved it. Last year I read Elizabeth Jane Howard's second novel, The Long View, which I also loved and was equally a f fabulously literary propulsive novel that just knocked my socks off. So I wanted to go back and start from the beginning of her oeuvre, and I think this one has knocked my socks off even a smidge more than this one, which I absolutely loved. I have a full review of this that I'll put a link to. This one is set just before, during, and just after World War I, and I had to keep re reminding myself of that information because it wasn't obvious other than that a few, several chapters in, World War One broke out, and then I said, oh, this isn't happening in the 40s or the 50s. That's right, that's right, I'd forgotten. So, once I got it in my mind, and have thought about it since, this is very much of a story of its time, but a fabulously quirkily feminist story about an unnamed protagonist who is growing up in a low middle class, what's, what's I've lost my term, shabby genteel family in London. Her father is a composer that nobody wants to listen to his music, <laughs> and nobody wants him to perform his music. I'm exaggerating, but he's not a very successful composer. And the protagonist's mother married beneath her class and isn't all that happy. But it's not the most dysfunctional family I've ever read about in fiction. It's just kind of a blandly unhappy home life. Mostly she's bored, and it's the boredom of our protagonist that carries her... Well, that's an interesting way to think about it. It doesn't propel her for the longest time. She is unhappy and open to new experiences, but doesn't have the wherewithal, the education, the the it, uh, inner drive to push her way very assertively into new experiences, but yet she seems to stumble upon them, and eventually that propels her forward, and she starts to take control of her life. And in that way, it's kind of like it made me think of Virginia Woolf's The Voyage Out. But it's been so long since I've read that novel that I don't know if that's a good comparison. Um, she is bored to tears, and she seems almost like she could be on the autism spectrum. What a fascinating character study this is. A lot happens in the novel. It's not merely a character study, although that would have been enough for me, because I don't care about plot, but there is a lot of plot here. But a certain kind of reader would be frustrated with her because she just kind of let things happen to her for the longest time. But that doesn't last for the whole novel, so there is a payoff. If that kind of passivity bugs you, you will need to keep reading. Um, as we all know, I think, that the period of the First World War was a time of profound social change, and so many men got killed. So but after the war, well, most of the men were dead, and all the women, at least in this class of, of British society, all they were prepared for was to get married. So then what do they do? And so it's within that social chaos that the, the story of this novel unfolds. And I thought it was so nuanced... I have never read a novel that, on the face of it, 80% of the story was so bland, yet all of it was completely fascinating. That's an Elizabeth Jane Howard thing. You, you're just never... I mean, if you like her stuff, I can now say, having read two novels, uh, that you, she just... it's impossible to feel bored in her capable hands. So the beautiful visit is that early on in the novel... I can't remember now if she gets invited. I think she gets invited to distant relatives of her mother's that her mother hasn't even seen for years out in the countryside and so she doesn't want to go but she's kind of curious to go and that's kind of her uh, push-pull um, defensiveness that is a big part of her character uh, but she goes and she has never met these people she don't don't think she knew any of them existed until the invitation arrived and it is a social awakening for her. I think she's about 16 years old, and I think she has her first kiss, and there's cousins and friends of the f these distant cousins, and she is 
a watcher. She's a people watcher. She's a bit of a wallflower. And so part of what makes this novel so fascinating for a certain kind of reader, a reader like me, is that there are so many keen, delicate, weird yet poignant observations of other characters. She doesn't really know how to relate to them. And it's a big struggle because she's as apt to sit there and not say anything to anybody as she is to risk putting her foot in her mouth, but she does take more and more risks as the story goes on. So it's a really wonderful coming-of-age story that, oh my god, it's like the anti-marriage plot. I don't want to give anything away, but if you don't like the marriage plot, I can't see that you wouldn't really enjoy this book. There is a proposal scene about three-quarters of the way through that if you're like me, and I mean, I, I like the marriage plot, it's, you know, it's how 90% of the people live and what they care about, so it, I care about it. But I also love the alternative narratives. And this one, there's a, there is a proposal scene that was so dramatic and delicious because it just didn't follow any of the expectations of what you'd think of, from, of a British novel published in 1950. Shocking. Fabulous. I loved it. But what excited me the most about this novel is... It opens with the prologue, where the protagonist is really... She wakes up groggy. She's sleeping on the bedroom of a cabin in a ship, and she doesn't seem to know how she got there. And then I got so wrapped up. Then we go to chapter one, and it's her as a 14-year-old girl, and the story moves sequentially up to the present. But I... This was a buddy read with my friend Leah in Calgary, and in our first or second check-in, she made a reference back to that prologue, and I thought... Oh my goodness, I completely forgot about that weird opening to the novel. And so then I kept it in my mind from there on in, thinking, this is a very conventional tale. Like I say, there's it's, it's doing interesting kind of untraditional things that you don't expect in a novel about a young British woman in the 19th, set in the World War I, yes. But it's still, there's a humdrum quality to it to think, how is she going to get to this? And so then we get the final chapter, which circles back to the prologue, and I have to tell you that it is one of the most exciting things that I've seen anybody do in a novel written in the middle 20th century. It's it's just, uh, holy smokes, I, I just got so excited. There were things that I thought in my first reaction to it that once I reread it maybe twice, I realized, oh no, that that is not what it was. But I think there's enough room for, there's enough ambiguity that you can apply uh, a whole, but you can get all conspiracy theoretical about it. Like, what's really going on? And it's just so exciting. So, for all of those reasons, I just think you all should rush out and, uh, well, you don't have to rush out, I guess. You know, it, it's it'll be there when you're ready. But it won some literary prize. And it launched uh, just a brilliant career for Elizabeth Jane Howard. I can't wait to read all the rest of her stuff. I'm not going to read a passage I've decided. I don't think I need to. I'm just going to read you one sentence where she is just feeling ambivalent and stressed. She has to make a choice. I don't even remember what the choice is, but this is one of the few sentences I underlined. In books, I found myself thinking bitterly. In books, the character would not at this point be in any doubt whatsoever. And she is always questioning everything, being in self-doubt, and most calm when she is allowed to just sit back and observe. But yet she makes dramatically feminist choices. I think it's a fantastic novel. You have to read it. Thanks for watching.